Gog. What a great looking movie. Apparently, the left eye was faded and lost most of its color prior to restoration, and I never would have guessed. The only clue was the occasional bright color, such as a red button on their uniforms that would twinkle a bit because the shade was dimmer in one eye. But other than that, I found this movie to be generally bright and beautiful. From what I've read, restoring this movie was something of a milestone for 3D Archive founder Bob Fermanac. He fell in love with the movie as a kid and later in life spent much time and money traveling to dangerous jungles and ancient burial sites in search of the long-lost 3D version of this movie. And eventually a faded copy was unearthed deep within a treacherous Mayan pyramid. And thank him I do for his journey, a gem of a movie that belongs on the shelf of any 3D collector. This was one of the last movies to be filmed using the natural vision rig, the actual last one being September's Storm, which didn't end up being released in 3D until recently, Gog as well was hardly seen in its intended stereo back in the 50s. By the time of its release in 54, very few theaters were willing to deal with the expense and headache of syncing up two projectors. The novelty of 3D had faded. And that's really too bad that they didn't get a chance to enjoy this. The films of this era were so well suited to stereo. They tended to have a lot in common with the stage, taking place in large rooms with bare but interesting set pieces and furniture that were usually large and easy to see in stereo, like these crazy crowded lab rooms we see here with all sorts of 3D candy sitting on the bench. I'd be interested to hear from a lab technician if any of these beakers make any sense in their arrangement. Now, I wouldn't call this movie slow moving, but you do get a comfortable amount of time to take in these shots. And there's enough variety to keep the scenery fresh throughout the running time. Always something new to look at. And for lovers of 3D ham, there are a few camera lunges, but only a few. Mainly, this movie wants the stereo to be pleasant and interesting, but not too obvious. From recollections of the director, we learn that they went to some effort to ensure the script would allow for stereo opportunities in a natural way that flowed with the story. The natural mechanics of being inside a deep military bunker, along with a sizable 50s-era mechanics, gives us plenty of bulky metal and concrete forms to dazzle our sense of depth, whether it's joists along the hallway or protruding viewers by this internal uh, reactor. I'm struck by just how large everything is in this movie. Old 3D movies tend to shy away from close-ups in stereo as it created convergence problems. Here is one of the few movies where it feels appropriate to stand back and feel small among all this heavy, big stuff. There are also some golden 3D moments, such as this fantastic frosted window view. I love a dirty window in stereo, and this was a joy to take in. It did leave me wondering if the detail was added to emphasize the atmospheric change in temperature or just to create an interesting stereo shot. Either way, it worked. Elsewhere, we get a great reflection shot showing us a control room and a transparent view of the twirling experiment going on in front of them. Window reflections create such a wonderful, ghostly, interdimensional feel. It really, I find, it projects what's going on inside of the observer's head. Another great 3D moment and a great example showing off the wonder of stereo without it feeling obnoxious. Now, the camera moves around a surprising amount, considering 
What they're using is the size of a family sedan that couldn't have been an easy feat, even on a soundstage. It's a nice touch. These are slow, gliding movements that let us focus and enjoy seeing the subject grow in our stereo view. The movement does cause a little camera wobble, but never enough to get in the way of enjoying the moments. Our scientists seem to take every opportunity here to light stuff on fire. And being in a bunker deep underground, I imagine that would be discouraged, but air quality doesn't seem important to these folks. It looks wonderful in 3D, though, typically very clear and relatively smoke-free. Fire is such an odd thing to consider in stereo. Unlike pure light, which tends to defy form, flicker, and be slightly different in each eye, fire has shape and volume that, for me, I tend to overlook in real life. But it's brought front and center when seen on 3D television. As a still image, it's almost like a field of crystal rocks, but in motion, it is perhaps more akin to upward flowing water. In modern movies, it's usually a quick explosion or in a conversion, fire can look a bit flaky, in the movie Inferno, there's a pretty good house fire scene. An ape has lots of models on fire, but uh, their camera was just f too inferior to really enjoy it. Now, it's possible that this movie, Gog, may have some of the best natively shot 3D fire I've seen in a film. Just a pleasure to look at. Now, the namesake of the movie is a couple of robots built with permanent metallic erections. No wonder they go crazy. Stiffy madness. Now, maybe my engineering skills are lacking, but I cannot imagine a scenario that would be well served by equipping this sealed underground bunker with flamethrowers. The fumes alone would probably knock everyone out before they had a chance to cook themselves. Now, there is an irony to this movie. On one hand, there is very little that doesn't invite ridicule. On the other hand, it's actually a fairly intelligent electronic murder mystery with primitive echoes of AI years before the world was introduced to Kubrick's HAL from a Space Odyssey. What's intriguing about this movie is the science involved is not without merit. The ticker tape memory unit or the tuning fork sensors are not terribly different than what exists in microscopic form on our modern phones. Today, our electronics are indistinguishable from magic. They just work, and very few know why. It reminds me of a theory that gazing into a crystal ball may be a fairy tale imitation of ancient television and magic incantations, a poetic reenactment of ancient programming. In a way, this movie is almost like being shrunk down to atom size and being trapped inside of a motherboard with its inner workings large and tangible. Some of you might know of a 90s cartoon called Reboot that was sort of along that line. I liked that show, and what was good about it was giving intangible electronic functions a physical form. There's a virus in the system, and you have to physically run into the memory to destroy it. It's fascinating how something made 75 years ago still translates so well in the imagination of today.